always in love. Let my heart reflect thy light, Lord, as the sun re moon reflects the light of the sun in love, always in love. Ooh, Allah, Allah, ooh, Allah, Allah, ooh, Allah, Allah, ooh, ooh, Allah, Allah, ooh, Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Really beautiful. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome, welcome. My name is Sumaya Khalifa. I am with the Islamic Speakers Bureau of Atlanta. If you don't mind, uh, if you could mute your mic, that would be uh, mostly appreciated. And we have a, a full program for you this evening, and it is, we're making history for East Cobb. This is the first ever virtual Ramadan iftar. Sorry, guys, but there's no food involved. Uh, we hope to bring your food, but that's kind of difficult to do it virtually. Um, so today we're going to hear from uh, different leaders within the community, the East Cobb community. And um, after we do that, then we're going to go into breakout rooms where we're going to have conversations as a group based on what we have learned and what we have heard uh, this evening. Just to let you know, most of the Muslims who are on this call, they have not had anything to eat or drink since about five o'clock this morning. So just to kind of put it into context for everyone. Um, so let us uh, go ahead and start off. Uh, I am uh, Sumaya Khalifa with the Islamic Speakers Bureau of Atlanta. And i um, so happy and so excited to be here with you this evening and to welcome my great friend, Hal. Uh, I, I got this wrong again. I'm just gonna go with Hal. Um, so Hal, so glad you're here. And uh, Hal is an amazing force of nature in our community. He is the uh, brain and the muscles behind the Thanksgiving, the annual ecumenical Thanksgiving event that thousands of people look forward to and attend every single year. Hal? I, I may go with muscle, not the brain, but thank you so much for the compliments. Um, as a way of introduction, we came together um, as that ecumenical planning committee um, because of some discord in East Cobb in May 2001. Uh, it was started unintentionally, I think, by a, unintentionally at least, I hope, by a mainstream Christian minister. And since 2005, several denominations of Christians, Jews, Hindus, Muslims, uh, Mormons, Sikh, Universalist Unitarians, and other faith-based communities have come together to celebrate our commonality and explore our differences. And I think that's what's been so great, and I've got to meet some wonderful people. We've, as a group, used themes to convey how we are the same, just different, including our views on the golden rule, peace begins with me, what you teach your children about other religions, the ripple effect, together we create waves of change, dare to do, and last year our theme was, am I my brother's keeper? We have built bridges, celebrated, broken bread together, kind of my favorite part because of the mango lassi and the baklava. Sorry, I didn't mean to talk food too much. Um, and, sub and subsequently, uh, we've been there to support each other when tragedy strikes one of our communities. We've been able to replace fear with friendship, replace hatred with humor, and replace ignorance with trust. So I want to thank everybody who's been making that happen because I'm not the brains of this and it is our community that has really come together and made it such a warm place in Cobb and North Fulton. And if you'd like to be part of the planning committee for this year's event, which is always the first Thursday, I'm sorry, the Thursday before Thanksgiving, please reach out to me or Temple Call Lemon. Thanks. Thank you so much, Hal. You bring so much goodness into our communities and your work and your very hard work actually is very much appreciated to make everyone welcome. And I know I've been to several of the ecumenical Thanksgiving events and it brings the whole world together and it just feels like what the world should be. So thank you for everything that you are doing and have done and will be doing in the future. And you're just a, a shining example for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank uh, you. Next. Again, it's on behalf of the whole committee. Yes. Thank you. Um, it's uh, my pleasure now and an honor to introduce Pastor Kristen Hyden, who is with the East Cobb United Methodist Church. I have to tell you, as soon as Kristen uh, came into her church, one of the first things that she did was reach out to different communities, different faith traditions, to say, hey, I want to meet with you, I want to get to know you, and we want to work together. So uh, this is the kind of person she is, and that's the kind of leader that we have uh, we have in our community, and we welcome her, and we are so happy you're here with us tonight. Thank you, Kristen. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks so much, Sumayo. I'm so honored to be a part of this this evening. Um, one of the things that our church um, has said from the beginning of, um, well, this pandemic that we are in is that we are reimagining what it means to be church and reimagining what it means uh, to be a community. And so when I received the invitation from Sumaya about our congregation uh, taking part in this event this evening, I knew it was the perfect occasion for us to be reminded um, of who we are as a wider East Cobb community. Um, we know that uh, we are called to be a, a people of faith that love our neighbor. And how can we love our neighbor if we don't truly know our neighbor? And so I'm just delighted to be a part of this tonight. I know there are a number of folks from the East Cobb United Methodist Church uh, congregation that are here with us this evening, a number of folks that have taken part in the uh, interfaith um, ecumenical Thanksgiving. Uh, I know my daughter and I, uh, she was a uh, six at the time, but she and I attended it together last year, and it was an, a wonderful way to um, introduce her to our wider community of faith. So I'm so delighted to be here. It's an honor. So thank you so much, Samaya. Thank, thank you so much for being here, and thank you so much for your beautiful words. And um, as you have seen when you came in with our slide, that tonight's event is brought together by uh, Hal's group, uh, which we're calling for this evening the Northwest Interfaith Group, and uh, by the uh, East Cobb United Methodist Church, and by uh, East Cobb Islamic Center, as long, along with the Islamic Speakers Bureau of Atlanta. So uh, we're bringing all these groups together to bring us a virtual Ramadan iftar. How beautiful is that? I want to give a shout out to my friend uh, Bob Bonstein, because he is a, another power in East Cobb that brings people together him and his uh, beautiful wife. Thank you so much for being here and for all the work that you do throughout uh, to bring communities and people together. Um, now, we're gonna turn into our Ramadan reflections and we have three people who will share what Ramadan means to them. And the first person is going to be Sara Amir and Sara is just graduated from the University of Georgia and um, I was just so proud of her. She got admitted into um, UGA's law school. And so we have a lawyer to be in our midst this evening. Sara? Thank you, Samaya, for that introduction. Um, so, Assalamu Alaikum, everyone. Peace and blessings upon all of you guys. Um, so, for my Ramadan reflection, I just wanted to speak a little bit about what Ramadan means to me personally. And for me, it means a lot of things. One of those being that it's a month of self-reflection. It's when I'm able to take time out of a busy year and reflect on where I am and where I want to be. And it gives me the time and the space to be intentional about the goals that I want to achieve and the struggles that I want to overcome as well. During Ramadan, it's also a time of gratitude and showing my appreciation for all of the blessings in my life. It's a time of increased prayers and reflections upon the Quran and realizing my responsibility as a Muslim to my family, my community, and the world around me in general. It also, it's a reminder to take part in good actions like donating to those in need and maintaining or learning a new good habit that I can carry with me throughout the rest of the year. And I'm also fortunate enough to be able to have Ramadan traditions with my family 
that allow me to explore my culinary talents and experiment with different foods for when we break our fast. Um, so this year I've taken up both baking and cooking and that has definitely led to some interesting developments in the kitchen. I've had some like really great stuff and there's still stuff that I could work on too. But I know that regardless of whatever I cook up in the kitchen, I can count on my mom making a traditional South Asian yogurt drink known as a lessi for all of us to enjoy after we break our fast with a date every night. And another action that has also been central to my Ramadans for the past few years has been attending the late night prayers, also known as Tarawih. So these are prayers that are special to the month of Ramadan and they typically take place inside our mosques every single night of the month. But, you know, due to the current situation, we aren't all able to attend these prayers and meet up with our community anymore. And as strange and weird as that has been for me, um, I've also been lucky enough to experience these prayers at home with my family. And that has shown me that the blessings and the virtue that comes with this month, it's not necessarily attributed to a certain place, but rather with my actions and the work that I put into my relationship with God. So yes, this year, Ramadan is missing those nights spent at the mosque or those chaotic mornings where everyone decides they wanna eat their pre-fast meal at IHOP at like 4.30 in the morning and those evening iftar get togethers. But it has given me something different in the form of prayers from my bedroom, for myself, for my friends, for my family, for those around the world who are in need of prayers. And I've also been able to spend a lot more time with my family. Um, normally, I would have been in Athens taking finals, finishing up the semester and all of that stuff. But I've been able to spend the whole month at home this year. And that's definitely been a blessing too. And most importantly, just throughout the uncertainty of this entire situation and everything that's going on, this Ramadan has shown me that to experience the blessings of this month, you don't always need these external factors. Sometimes all you need is yourself and your prayer mat and just a little bit of time and you'll be able to find that special feeling that comes with every Ramadan. It's a reminder to me that everything that I'm capable of during this month, I'm able to do the same outside of this month, to be more intentional with my actions and what I say to other people, to spend my time wisely throughout the day and to maintain a strong connection with my faith. It's a beautiful reminder to me of everything I can be and everything our community can be when we devote the time and the effort into being the best versions of ourselves. So thank you so much for listening to my Ramadan Reflection. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing who's next. <laughs>So that was so beautiful. Thank you so much for letting us into your world and what Ramadan means to you. That's just really, really, really very profound and gets us all thinking about that. Um, as a reminder for all of us, that when we go into the breakout rooms, um, one of your questions will, will be is, what have you heard in the conversations today that resonates with you and what are you gonna do about it, right? So we've had, we've heard from Hal, we've heard from Kristen, we've heard from Sarah, and we have two more folks to hear from, and then we're gonna go into the breakout room. So I just wanted to make sure that you are, are thinking about this and listening with um, um, closely to pick up some things that you could talk about in your breakout rooms. So again, Sarah, thank you so much. Our next speaker is Faraz Iqbal, and Faraz is an executive. Uh, here in Metro Atlanta, and he's also part of Leadership Atlanta, class of 2020, and uh, he is on the board of the Islamic Speakers Bureau of Atlanta. Faraz? Thanks, Sumaya. Greetings of peace to everyone. Assalamu alaikum. So uh, again, as Sister Sumaya said, I live in Tucker, Georgia. I am married, have four kids and two cats. If I were to be, if my wife was here, I'd have to say six kids because the two cats are considered part of the family as kids. So, um, you know, uh, I'm going to start off a little bit in terms of uh, what we do in terms of Ramadan when we uh, break our fast and then kind of get a little bit more into the reflections of, of what we've been doing. So what's a typical day in the Iqbal household when it comes to eating a meal? So what happens is uh, once sunset happens, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little show and tell for everyone today. So hopefully this kind of works pretty well. Uh, if not, then we'll cut over, no problem. <laughs> So one of the things that we, we look at here is um, we break our fast with dates. And so um, there's an old recipe that my wife got from her grandmother. 
and it's basically um, frying dates in butter. Now, we don't look at cal calorie counts at this point in time because we've been fasting all day, but these are actually fried in butter and we, eat, we break our fast with these. The general prophetic uh, tradition is to break your fast with dates. So that's what we do here. Um, over here is a Pakistani, um, uh, an Indian uh, piece. It's called a pakora. It's like um, a flour. It's like a fried flour with a lot of cool stuff inside of it. Um, and so it's, it's, it's pretty greasy, but again, we don't look at uh, when it comes to calories, but this is something else that we eat as well. And then we have the samosa, again, from the Asian subcontinent, which is uh, filled with either chicken, beef, or it could be vegetable. Uh, this one is chicken, uh, which you can see uh, has not been touched yet because the sun is not down yet. So that's what we have in terms of breaking. We also have what we call fruit jot. Now, Asia, you know, us in the Pakistani Indian subregion, we believe everything needs to be spicy, so we even put uh, spices in our fruit. You can see, looks pretty good there, but I cannot touch. Uh, but we call this fruit chat, and uh, this is, we also break our fast with this. Now, I've shown you a pretty uh, cultural piece here. You have India, Pakistan, India, Pakistan, but then there's America, and this is what is the donuts. This is my rose petal almond donut from Dali Donuts. Not a plug-in for Dali Donuts, but it's really good. I am only taking half for today because the other half I will have after prayer because uh, I'm going to need my sugar for that as well too. So that's how we open our fasts um, in the Iqbal household. Related to some other things, um, you know, that are meaningful to us, I just wanted to share with you. So these are um, prayer beads or we call dhikr beads. Um, I actually got these from Saudi Arabia when I went for my first pilgrimage. Um, so there's a lot of meaning behind this and I, I generally do carry this around, but during the month of Ramadan, um, I do this, and, and we do this too. We recite uh, words from the Quran, and it's more of a reflective and spiritual moment when you recite. It's kind of repetitive nature, similar to in the Christian faith, how you have rosary beads. Um, we have these, they're, they're, they're thicker beads. Also, we have what we call ithar, and this is just something to smell good. Um, so it's oil, and we get these scents from different parts of the world. Um, it's a tradition, not only on Fridays to put on ithar, but during the month of Ramadan, to kind of keep things uh, nice and, and smell nice from there. So that's kind of um, what, what we eat in the, in the Iqbal household. Now, if I may, just to kind of uh, transition, I'm gonna transition back to here. Okay, great. Um, you know, what does, what does uh, Ramadan mean to me? So, you know, this year it's been quite different because, um, you know, with COVID-19, we've been indoors. And so, um, you know, going to the mosque has been a, is a regular routine. And so this year we've been staying at home and, you know, we've been doing our prayers at home. Um, we, we recite the Quran at home, we come together as a family and what we, we've been doing what we call the Tarawi prayers. And, um, and you know, it's, it's a great opportunity this year to really come together, pray together and really reflect. Um, I have really had a great time this year. Um, it's been different. Uh, it's different not going to the mosque and getting that communal feeling, but what's really been awesome is that I've been able to pray with my family in a more intimate manner, and, you know, myself and my son have been leading the prayers, so it's been really cool uh, standing behind my sons and let them leading the prayers, right? My, my eldest is 15, my twin boys are 13, and my daughter is 12, so uh, standing behind, you know, my kids and while they're praying uh, has been, you know, uh, very uplifting for me and spiritual for me as well. After we kind of do our prayers, we kind of sit down and we hang out. And there's a really cool book called The Book of Love uh, by Yaya Ninui. And what we do is we randomly pick a quote. So I'll just ask the kids, give me a page number. They'll give me a page number and we'll randomly just pick a quote and just talk about it and reflect. And so that's been really good too, because we just want to kind of sit back, relax, and just talk about what's on our mind. It's been a great opportunity for me to really get to know our kids, you know, get to know my kids better um, because there's no right or wrong answer. It's whatever that comes to your mind. And so um, that's been really good. Um, I'll share one quote with you that I found uh, that's, that's kind of stuck with us um, from the book of love. And that is, what you see is a reflection of you. If your heart is pure, you will see beauty everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we just, I just thought I'd share that with you. That's something that kind of stuck with me when we were kind of going over the book um, and do it there. Lastly, you know, uh, with, with uh, the way we are staying in shelter or staying at home. Um, we've been doing a lot of Zoom, a lot of video conferencing with the grandparents. Um, we'll check up on each other, see how everyone is doing, 
uh, we'll kind of, I'll kind of look at see what my grandparents, you know, my, my mom makes home cooked meals, I miss, I miss those lamb chops, so she might kind of show those every now and then as a tease, but um, you know, it's really a good opportunity for uh, the kids to kind of get together, talk with the grandparents, talk with the aunts and uncles, and uh, really appreciate life. You know, um, COVID-19 has really changed perspectives, and I think it gives us a really good opportunity to appreciate what we have today and never take for granted what we were given. And um, that's been a really big internal reflection, getting closer to God, contemplating, reflecting, and really counting all of the blessings that we have. Um, it, it's, it's, it's not often that the entire world goes on pause. And, you know, the fact that it's on pause and we have the ability to enjoy it and understand what's going on has been a really great experience so far. So uh, that's it for me in terms of reflection, Sister Samaya. Thank you so much for us. That was so beautiful. And thank you for the show and tell. Uh, you made us all very hungry and we might come over for iftar then. Well, we got to keep our social distance, right? So we can't, we can't do that. But hopefully soon we all get together and eat the wonderful food. Um, just wanted to point out that Muslims are very diverse. And um, so the religion is, is important, but also the cultural background and what, what people eat and don't eat and how they eat it is so impacted by their cultural background. So with, for instance, an African-American uh, breaking the fast or a Chinese-American or uh, Arab-American, that would all look so different. So just wanted to kind of bring that out in terms of the diversity within the Muslim community. Now, our last speaker for the evening is Imam Akib. And we're so glad you're here. He just joined uh, the uh, East Cobb Islamic Center not too long ago. And when we started talking about having an interfaith virtual iftar, he was all in and he was so excited. And I loved, loved his passion and just let's do it. So, uh, Imam. Good evening, everyone. Uh, peace and blessings to all of you. I'm so grateful to be here. And I'm you know, thankful to uh, Sister Sumeya to uh, have us here, have our whole community here. A lot of our members of the community are also here with us today. Um, uh, but, uh, but today I'll be uh, talking a little bit about, I guess, Ramadan, right? What is Ramadan? What are the implications of Ramadan? And, um, you know, it's, it, it consists of a lot of things. Like, as you already heard from the previous reflections, um, that, you know, it's about fasting, abstaining from food, uh, what to break your fast with, as well as uh, reflecting upon yourself Self-reflection leads to, you know, self-discipline. So uh, there are different various virtues in Ramadan that we observe, uh, you know, with fasting, you know, uh, all the Muslims throughout the globe that they take this month to observe fast in these daylight hours and abstain from food and drink and intimate desires, as well as um, reflecting upon oneself, was worshiping God, building a connection, uh, a relationship with Islam, the religion, and with God. Right, so Ramadan focuses on that, uh, and through that, it teaches us self-discipline. It teaches us how to be grateful for, you know, not only for the blessings around us and our religion, but even our society. People like you and I, we're grateful for each other, and to cultivate that love and foster that love and sympathy for one another as well. Ramadan is also a month uh, of remembrance that we remember our religion, we remember our roots, we, we remember God, we are grateful for these blessings, as well as we remember the people who are less privileged, who are underprivileged rather, who are less fortunate than you and I, right? So when we fast, when we undergo the fast, and we deny our bodies food and drink and etc., we use that, you know, to replenish our souls, to replenish our spirits and not our bodies. And in the, in, in, uh, at the same time as well, while we undergo the fast, we are also remembering those who don't, you know, who have to fast year round, but, you know, not by choice, not voluntarily, but because they don't have the essentials to sustain themselves. They don't have the essentials to nourish themselves. So we remember those people as well who don't have the luxury of, you know, having breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and, you know, who have Sunday brunches, who, who go out to eat with friends on, on a year round basis. So we remember the less fortunate while we are fasting as well and how we can help them throughout this month and even after the month is over as well. And so Ramadan is also a month of remembering those people, remembering people who are underprivileged, who are less fortunate than you and I. Ramadan, uh, the underlying theme of Ramadan, which leads, after accentuating all these different 
rituals of Ramadan, fasting, gratitude, uh, being thankful, self-reflection, um, caring for one another, that leads to, you know, caring for one another on a larger basis, on a, you know, on a, on a, um, on a society-wise level that we are advocating and we are, you know, activists for people who are getting, you know, discriminated, for people who are marginalized, for people who are not getting their rights respected, who are not being heard. So Ramadan is also a month of, you know, advocacy and activism. You know, one of the, one of the, the tenets of Islamic activism is uh, to always be on the side of those who are oppressed, which involves advocating for those who have no voice in society. So Ramadan also promotes that. Islam uh, in general promotes that. And in Ramadan, we get closer to our religion. We, you know, as the previous, uh, as the previous re reflections, you know, we can tell that, you know, it's a time where you build your own connection with God. You know, you, you, you do it as a family as well. You do it as a community, not right now because we're all you know, under lockdown and during this pandemic, but on a, on a, uh, usually we would build our connection with God on a community level as well, on a familial level, and as well as on a personal level as well, right? So when we build this connection with Islam, with our religion, our religion tells us to be just. Our religion tells us to stand up for, uh, you know, social causes. Our religion tells us to stand up for those who are voiceless, those who are impoverished, those who are, um, you know, uh, those who are marginalized, right? Uh, the Prophet Muhammad, he actually paraphrases God by saying that God said that it is forbidden upon me, uh, injustice is, is forbidden upon me. So I command you all to also steer away from injustice. Meaning that as, as you know, as Muslims, as human beings, it's our, you know, we ought to stand up for those causes. We ought to stand up for those who are oppressed, those who are discriminated, those who, for those who don't have a voice, those amongst the minorities, right? Unfortunately, uh, you know, the, the world is such that, um, you know, we have to have these causes to stand up for people. We have to have these rallies. We have to retweet posts. We have to bring and cause awareness to these kind of things. It should already be like this, that we already care for one another. We already uh, are supporting one another. But unfortunately, we have to go out of our way to have these different rallies and different causes. But, you know, Islam promotes that. And, you know, Ramadan really maximizes that for us as well. That to stand up for those people who don't have three meals a day, to, uh, you know, support those people who are, you know, have, or who are struggling throughout their lives, you know, struggling to provide for their family members, uh, supporting those people who are, and, you know, making a, a safer society for those people who go out for a jog and they don't know that they're going to come back home or not. Right to go out for a jog and they might get hunted down like an animal, right? So Islam tells us to do that as well. And you know this this platform we have today, this uh, session we're having today, is also a first step of you know social justice. It's also a first step of advocacy. That each and every one of us here, being here, it you know it manifests social justice. That you know being here, you know amongst you all, this is so beautiful that we're you know building bridges, we're building relationships where you know that we can stand together. We can support the same causes together and we can, you know, uh, implement social justice in the best po possible way. So the month of Ramadan, it tells us to, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a motivation rather and an incentive to um, strive towards an egalitarian society, right? So when you ask someone what Ramadan is or what does Ramadan mean, Ramadan means a lot of things, right? It, it doesn't mean that, uh, it doesn't only mean that I'm skipping out on, you know, Sunday brunch with the boys or I'm, you know, I can't just wake up and eat anything from the fridge. But Ramadan means that it's a month of blessings, a month of mercy. It's a month of remembering people, remembrance. It's a month of activism and advocacy. It's a month of social justice as well. And while we are abstaining from, you know, things that are permissible for us on a daily basis, like food and water, we're abstaining from those things. We are denying our bodies of those things so that we can focus on those people that don't, ha that don't, that don't have those things so that we can focus on others in our society, right? So Ramadan is a month where we shift from, where we shift our mentality from selfishness to selflessness, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what Ramadan is to us, so that we can in, in, in inculcate these values and principles that we learned in Ramadan and reflect on our relationship with God and humanity, subsequently leading us to manifest this outside of Ramadan as well. So, you know, that's, um, you know, this is a very first step for all of us, hopefully to, you know, stand behind these causes together. I'm looking forward to 
uh, meeting you all in person and you know working together as 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 a community uh thank you so much for listening to me thank you so much for reminding us our role and responsibility not only to ourselves but to the wider community and to each other that was very beautiful thank you very much thank you oh, wow there's a lot to process here so now we're going to go on to our breakout rooms and the breakout rooms um we're going to hope and pray and we have so many people of faith here that um that zoom puts puts all of us diverse people together in one room versus all muslims together all jews together all christians together so hopefully we have a nice mix and uh the things that you need to be thinking about is when you go out to your breakout room make sure that everybody has an opportunity to speak and also um identify somebody who's going to be your spokesperson because we want to um, come back afterwards to hear what took place in your breakout room.